Welcome to In the Gutter, a podcast that is all comics, all bangers, all the time, with story expert Lonnie Diane Rich and superhero scholar Joshua Unruh. One of the hosts has read almost no superhero comics, and the other has read almost all of them. We'll let you sort out which is which. And now, In the Gutter. You, okay, so this isn't this week, but you, but you will yes. be entertained. This ties in to to that conversation that like when you and I get down to business it's business and we mm-hmm. know what we're doing and we have right the mm-hmm. thing um so uh i went to uh we talked about this the spicy birthday mm-hmm. uh spicy of actually yes. in case this makes it in the podcast spicy as in eating actual spicy food not spicy <laughs> like ropes and chains <laughs> all right okay clarification all right, just... there okay. you go mm-hmm. um so uh, my co-host of an animated discussion, Caleb Masters, has his 31st birthday. He does a uh, uh, 30 hot ones. How did you do it? Hot 30 uh-huh. ones? Whatever. Like, we had to eat spicy <laughs> shit, and he interviewed yeah. us. And I was the second person to go uh, in the interview. And I actually, mm-hmm. first of all, found shit that was too hot for me. Woo! That does not happen wow. very often, gang. Mm-hmm. But the second thing was... I come out of my interview and one of uh, Caleb's other friends that I've met several times, you know, who also mm-hmm. does podcasting, but kind of like idly. And a lot of times it's like mm-hmm. a role playing game AP, you know, yes. uh, actual play. Right. And uh, and I came out and he was like the audacity of you two sitting in there eating spicy stuff and there's barely any dead air. The conversation is <laughs> like tight and interesting. You you goddamn professionals. And I was like, well, we've done 99 episodes of our main podcast together. Right. Like we've had mm-hmm. some practice. And he was like, yeah, but there was no script. That wasn't about Batman. And I was like, let's be real. Some of it was about Batman. <laughs> And I feel like we would be in a similar boat. Like there would just be, you know, yeah. you could just, uh, hey, Lonnie and Josh, here's the topic. To what you guys got some opinions about it, and we would we, just be first fine. of all, we always have opinions about pretty much everything. Oh, sure. Like, you and I are never short of it. You and I very rarely go, eh, I don't know. Like, sometimes, honestly, we're <laughs> sometimes they're even informed opinions now and then. But on occasion, that yeah. will actually Rare happen. Moments. But yeah, like. And it's funny because even when you and I are having a conversation and there's no audience and there's no recording and it's just us chatting and catching up, we still sound like we're podcasting. We sound the same. It's because we <laughs> think the other one is our favorite audience when we're talking to each other. <laughs> well, you know what? I think it's true. Yeah. I think we are each other's favorite audience. Yeah, yeah 100%. <laughs> Hundred percent, absolutely. All right. So, as long as we've got an audience and we are each other's favorite audience, I suppose we should get started and talk about this week's episode, this week's issue of Captain America: Winter Soldier, where uh, this is the end of the first arc. It is, which is kind of exciting for me because now I'm beginning to understand a little bit about how arcs work. Uh huh. Um, uh-huh. And because it, it's a different kind of story structure, we're definitely going to talk about that. Um, but yeah, like I, I guess I don't know. Should I just get into the summary? Let's do, do the summary so we can get into Let's the good the shit and get into the good shit. All right, roll that music, Jack. In Captain America Winter Soldier number six, we open with a lackey on the phone with General Lucan preparing the scene. A bomb about to go off. Jack Monroe's dead body as the scapegoat and Sharon Carter as the bait. Sounds like a typical Tuesday to me. On the S.H.I.E.L.D. helicarrier, Nick Fury and Sharon's on-again, off-again Bo Tapper are worrying about where Sharon is, and Tapper's feeling like an ass because he was so jealous of Steve Rogers. But Tapper, you had to know that if you get into a love triangle with Captain America, you're always going to be the bottom left vertex. And as we all know, the bottom left vertex is the one that gets left. Meanwhile... Cap has Agent Uber take him to the small island in the English Channel where he died. While he's checking out the abandoned castle that was a Nazi fortress during the war, he remembers Bucky being tortured there. And then, suddenly, ghost Nazis are shooting real bullets at him, and he figures it out. The Cosmic Cube. As he leaves, he sees himself and Bucky on a motorcycle. They jump from the motorcycle to an escaping Nazi missile, which Bucky thinks he can stop. Cap loses his grip and falls off, but Bucky is stuck and the missile blows up in midair. Cap goes back to the S.H.I.E.L.D. plane and Agent Uber and instantly gets hit with a vision of Sharon gagged and tied on a rooftop. He tells Agent Uber he needs to get to the States now. 
Later, Cap jumps out of a moving plane, but takes the time to check in with Fury and tell him Sharon's been captured, which Fury already knew. Cap says he's going in, lands on the rooftop, takes down the guys with Sharon, and removes the duct tape from her mouth. She tells him it's a setup, which comes as no surprise, but then she says that she's seen the man who killed Red Skull, and she thinks it's Bucky. Cut to Bucky on a nearby rooftop with a sniper rifle, asking General Lucan if he should take the shot. Lucan says no, just execute the plan, and Bucky hits a red button. At that moment, we see Fury looking at a series of security photos of Bucky just as Tapper calls in. He's found Jack Monroe's body and a bomb, which he tries to disarm just as it explodes. From the nearby rooftop, Cap and Sharon huddle to protect themselves from the blast. In a plane, Lucan's buddy is freaking out, asking Lucan to stop all this madness. But Lucan holds the glowing cosmic cube and says that by the time anyone catches up with him, it'll be too late. All right, Josh. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. We got to the end of the arc. What do you think? What's your overall response? Uh, my overall response to that synopsis is that I need to step up my fucking synopsis game because I am so lazy <laughs> compared to this. <laughs> uh, my overall response. Been doing this a long this, time. Yeah, this is amazing. OK, OK, OK. I don't know if I can impart to you or our listeners who weren't there when this happened. Yeah. How big a deal. Mm -hmm. this Bucky reveal was. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It is 2005. We literally could not have imagined this reveal. Yeah. And, and in retrospect, you and I have reread this now. Uh -huh. and, uh, and well, you read it the first time and you know that Bucky's going to show up. And that's right. kind of spoiled for you. Yeah. And looking at it now, this is only my third time. And there are clues, mm -hmm. right? Obviously, it's very Bucky focused, you know, lots of stuff. Mm -hmm. But in 2005, I'm going to say again, I don't think I can explain to you how out of nowhere, how mm. mind blowing this was. Yeah. Bucky was one of the handful of they will always stay dead characters right. in comics. Mm -hmm. And and I think, I mean, Brubaker's no fool. He knew that he was going to have a hill to climb if he was going to bring Bucky mm -hmm. back. So what what a wild swerve to bring Bucky back, not for like a tearful, joyful reunion, but instead, hey, look, he's the devil's red right hand, huh? <laughs> it's a fucking coup is what it is. Well, and you know what's and, funny? Yeah, yeah. Like, I knew that was coming. We've been talking about it all along. Clearly, this was something that nobody was, you know, hiding behind a lampshade or anything, you know. Um, but even in that moment, when, you know, you flip the page and there's Bucky, you know, like, and Sharon says it was Bucky and then boom, mm -hmm. it's Bucky. And we see him looking all winter soldiered out, you know, um, it was kind of amazing. You know, it's just this really powerful yeah. moment, even for me as somebody who didn't have any of that history, who knew exactly what was coming. So I cannot imagine if I'd had that history in the storytelling, if I knew this universe, if I knew Bucky was never coming back. You know, and then to see that happen, like how powerful that would have been. Yeah. I, I, mean, I mean, stunning is like too small a word. And and I mean, I don't want to overplay this. Like it's mm -hmm. still, it's just superhero comics, you know, right. but also part of it just being superhero comics is that sometimes you're just like, yeah, I basically know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's hacky bullshit. And sometimes it's because it's good storytelling, right? right. Because good storytelling means you can see the shape of the thing mm -hmm. before it happens, like the track right. is laid. But with this one, man, yeah, just jaw dropping, just absolutely legitimately jaw dropping mm -hmm. the there was it comics journalism like online was kind of a thing mm -hmm. in the early 2000s and the buzz that was a buzz about bucky returning it was it was a time to be alive friends <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, that must have been, you know, pretty wild. And I think that it's still a good move, you know. Um, but I do find it interesting, though, because my understanding is that comic books and soap operas are absolutely famous for bringing people back from the dead. So yes. the thing that I find interesting is that somehow, even in you know, that whole, like, um, you know, like, storytelling culture of, of this, mm -hmm, like, incredibly mm -hmm. broad, that, that they made it so that Bucky would never come back and everybody knew Bucky was never going to come back, right? Um, that, to me, seems interesting, like, how, how you take a character off the table, you know, um, through these, is it just because all that time had passed and Bucky had never come back, so people just forgot about him? Or were there things in the stories that 
that reinforced this idea that Bucky would never come back because that death had such incredible impact on the world? Such a great question. Mm -hmm. First of all, let me say, this was not like editorial edict. It was kind of just consensus, I think, Mm -hmm. right? Um, I think that the biggest reason that Bucky was never going to come back is that Bucky is too much of a throwback to pre-Marvel Marvel. Ah, okay. okay. Now, now, was his loss incredibly impactful to Captain America? Of course, mm-hmm. right? And and we've seen Cap take on additional sidekicks, always adults mm-hmm. since then, or almost always adults since then. Um, but the main reason I think, like the big reason is they didn't want to draw attention to the fact that once upon a time, kids' sidekicks were a thing even briefly in the Marvel universe. Okay. Uh-huh. This is, okay. this was a thing that dropped off. Mm-hmm. Um, as mentioned before, I don't need to go through the whole thing, but as mentioned before, kids sidekicks were like all the rage mm-hmm. in the forties. Uh, sensational character find of 1940, Robin, the boy wonder bursts onto the scene and everybody goes, Oh, that's hot shit. And everybody gets one. <laughs> like if you're right. cool, you got a sidekick. Mm-hmm. The thing that Marvel did that was, well, I've mentioned before the writing style was kind of young adult compared to aimed at kids versus mm-hmm. DC when they when they really showed up in the mid 60s. Um, but part of that YA feel was that a lot of the Marvel characters were kids themselves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they didn't have kids sidekicks. They were children. The X-Men were children, were yeah. teenagers. Mm-hmm. Spider-Man, their flagship character, a teenager. Mm-hmm. Right. And from that perspective you can't you you sort of can't juxtapose those things and have it make sense like mm-hmm. a kid partner in a universe where the kids can just be their own hero like doesn't yeah work. Mm-hmm. and so i think that it was just like look bucky is part of our history it's not that we're not going to mention him but he was so impactful him dying was so impactful mm-hmm. to captain america and we don't really want to like throw a lampshade on the mm-hmm. fact that we stopped doing that stuff. So, you right. know, it just became like a, like a uncomfortable storytelling friction, mm-hmm. uh, which by the way, to go back an issue is I think one of the reasons that Brubaker makes an effort to age Bucky up to yeah. young adulthood as mm-hmm. opposed to teen right. levels. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think it's, it's that it's largely consensus. That's partly like, Ooh, we're not sure how we would do that. And then when you're not sure how you would do something for so long, you start to go, maybe we just shouldn't, <laughs> you know, let's just not. Right. Right. Okay. That's good. Because I think that, when you have a combination of all of these elements that just sort of happen to make us think mm-hmm. that this will not be a thing, um, to find a way to bring it back is a wonderful way to bring in a surprise that has been, yeah. you know, that, yeah. has, that has been laid down, you know, for you to just pick it up. So, you know, once again, got to say some brilliant stuff happening in this issue. Yeah, I, I mean, that's we've talked about how good Brubaker is at juggling multiple things, yeah. but this is the point when I can really take a step back and go, kind of like we couldn't believe the reveal. I'm trying to imagine being a fly on the wall of the editor's office when Brubaker was like, now calm the fuck down. I'm going to bring Bucky back. Like, I don't even know how yeah. you start that conversation. Okay, guys, I know that this is like an unwritten rule. Stop right there. And he'd be like, no, let me finish. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring Bucky back. Uh, Stop right there. I mean, how many stop right there's were there in that conversation? Right. Probably a lot. Mm -hmm. I I can't even imagine the pitch. Yeah. And I wish I'd been there for it. Um, Yeah. Just, just uh, good stuff. Good stuff all around. All right, so let's go ahead and like start talking about the art, you know. Um, for the cover for this issue, we have this montage of imagery. We've got Cap thrusting his shield. There's explosions. Cap and Bucky down at the bottom of the picture on his motorcycle. Uh, the Nazi missile shooting at us from the background. The only static elements are the Nazi flags looming in the background. And Zemo watching from the sidelines, which I think is kind of like here he is a source of such chaos and yet the only like still image in the whole thing. Yeah. I I mean, I kind of jokingly put in the notes like, boy, howdy, this issue sure is going to be about Bucky. eh?" (laughs) 
Because everything on this cover is basically Bucky centered or centered yeah. on their last mission, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah, that that like the looming. And I got to tell you, I mean, I'm not I'm not going to go too far down this road, but I'm mm-hmm. just going to say again, the idea of Nazism as a looming threat mm-hmm. hits different now, yeah, than 2005, mm-hmm. yeah, and. Even looking back, I'm like, man, yeah, like that's the only stuff that's chill. Yeah. Is, the, is this is this legacy of evil that's just going to float around back there, including Baron Zemo, who, yeah. as discussed, like came out of retirement to Battle Cap, died, and his son was like, well, all right, I'll also be Baron Zemo and fuck up Cap's universe. Like that that intergenerational evil. Mm-hmm. It, well, it's been a thing and it's going to continue to be a thing. So yeah. it's really, yeah, pretty fun pretty fascinating little piece of cover art there it is it is pretty powerful um all right so what'd you think about the interior art i mean we talked about this a little bit last time this is the place where you go it's more the same Mm -hmm. i mean the face acting in this issue is tremendous um the contrast between the present and the untrustworthy past Mm -hmm. very great especially when they kind of i kind of wonder if they got michael lark to draw Mm -hmm. The kind of phantom people that show up in the present. I don't know that, but wouldn't that have been dope? Right. Yeah. That would have been amazing. Yeah, because he does the flashbacks and so when together. Yeah. Right. I don't I don't there's not enough for me to know. I I don't feel like there's enough for me Mm -hmm. to know whether they did that or not, but it's like that's an interesting idea. And even just thinking, ooh, there's been so much past and present Mm -hmm. like juxtaposed that in this issue we finally like lay them right on top of each other. Like I think that's thematically, Mm -hmm. tonally really interesting. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And even the action, which again, I I think Epting does a good job with action, but not a great job. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we actually kind of got above average action stuff from Epting. It's oh. just it's just spectacular stuff. It's amazing. Like I, you know, we don't talk about the interior art that much because we have the same we have the same thing to say every week. Oh my god, <laughs> it's amazing. And even the action sure sequences, like action sequences again, not my favorite. I don't typically care for them. In movies, I especially don't care for them. But in yeah. a comic book, first of all because I think they are of necessity kept tight, you know, in a comic mm-hmm, book, because mm-hmm. we don't have that much space to spend on, you know, thwack and, and you know, flying shields and all that kind of stuff. Um, so they do it with such incredible power. They get to the point of what the action sequence is there for. Um, yes. And then they move through it. And they uh, it's just, it's such incredible artwork. It astounds me every week. So even though we don't spend a lot of time talking about it, it's just because it like really is. It's just so incredibly good. And if anybody out there listening has not yet read this stuff, I cannot recommend enough. Just go and grab it because it's it's been really incredible. I'm very excited to read the rest of it. So let's talk about this story. <laughs> All right. So we did this whole thing a while back where you were explaining to me the difference between volumes and, and arcs and oh, you know, yeah. series and, and all this kind of stuff. And I'm still it's still a little foggy in my brain because it's taking me a while to wrap myself around it. But what I do know is story. What I do know is how story works. And so here we are. We've gotten to issue six. And, you know, there was a time where I was like, how in the world are they going to tell this whole story, you know, like in these six issues or whatever? <laughs> and the fact is that they don't. They don't. It's act they don't. one. It's act one of a story. But it is like you, if you're talking about an arc, you know, I mean, there is an arc of like, here we are. We're setting everything up. We're fine. We're figuring out where everything is. We're putting everybody in place. We're, you know, uncovering a mystery of what it is that's actually happening to Cap. Of course, in this issue, he figures it out that it is the Cosmic Cube. We also have an escalation, a lovely escalation mm. of these memories in that there are physical Nazi bullets being shot at Cap. And that shit's weird. Yeah. And like, as soon as that happens, that's when he's like, all right. You know, somebody is making shit happen. And as soon as he is gets out of his head and into the world, you know, with his concept of what is going on, he's like, fuck it. It's, you know, it's the cosmic cube. It's whoever killed Red Skull, you know, all this stuff and and has this idea of, of what's going on. But yeah, when you were talking about a story arc, I was thinking that there would be like um kind of like a, a season of television, right? That there would be a story right. that would be finished. But that's not what's happening here. It really is... Act, act one, it's setting up what is going to happen, I presume, throughout the rest of this particular book, right? Yeah, yes. Mm-hmm. So um, 
one thing that I maybe overplayed a little bit when I was trying to explain that mm-hmm. to you in the interest of simplicity. Sure, yes. Is that the the arc style storytelling mm-hmm. that has become popular um, typically does have a beginning, middle, and end, right? Mm-hmm. And it's sometimes it's six issues, seven, eight. You yeah. might have a whole year, maybe even a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Like, I, um, th- so they do, and and the creators typically show up, kind of like I got a Spider Man story to tell, yeah. I got a Batman story to tell, mm-hmm. whatever. Um, so I stand by, you mm-hmm. know that that description. Yeah. That is a lot of how the kind of wait for the trade, mm-hmm. decompressed storytelling kind of took place. Yeah, this is. In a lot of ways, a big throwback. Yeah. Because Brubaker is going to be on this book for a long time. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's not like I have one story to tell that may take seven to 24 months and I'm out. Like sure. he mm-hmm. hangs in there. Mm-hmm. And so from that perspective, yes, this arc, I do feel like it has kind of a beginning, middle, and end. Mm-hmm. But it's also an end that understands it's feeding into another beginning, middle, and end that's going to feed into another beginning, right. middle, and end. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, yeah. I, I may have overplayed that in the interest of simplicity yeah. beca- in a way that does not apply to this story. Mm-hmm. But you're right. I do feel like there's maybe not the most satisfying ending, but there's definitely like an, oh, shit, you know, kind well, of moment yeah. where a lot of threads come together, right? right? A lot of threads come together and it ends in a game changer, not a cliffhanger. Yes. Which is what yes. I love. For those of you, I don't know if we've discussed that on this. I discuss it everywhere eventually, pretty much. Because <laughs> it's important. It is important. Um, a, a cliffhanger is when we have somebody who is in danger, something is about to happen, but it has not happened yet and we don't know what's going to happen. That is a cliffhanger. Um, and then usually once it's resolved, you're like, oh, okay. You know, and then the story just goes on. What a game changer does is it shows you what happened. Bucky came back, right? And now the world is different. Now we yes. can never, the, yes. this is a point that we can never go back to before that happened. Like the world is just different now. Um, and so that's why game changers are awesome. Cliffhangers, like I understand where they come from and, and especially why storytellers and publishers feel feel like they need them because, oh my God, nobody's going to come back if we don't have this question looming of like, you know, does Cap fall off the cliff literally, you know, or not. Um, But the reality of it is that like, if you're telling a good story, readers are going to come back. And I think eventually there became like, writers became to get more secure. We rely less on cliffhangers, I think in recent years uh, than we used to. And, um, and also really getting to understand the beautiful versatility of a good game changer um and that's what we've got here so i think that like we have the setup um we have the sense of you know of of what is going to happen the battle that is between like it is cap as protagonist it is luke and his antagonist that has not been resolved so our story like our central narrative conflict has not been resolved this is not the end of this story a story has not been completed you know that said um i don't hate it as an ending point for this arc I think that it is really mm-hmm. interesting. I like the fact that next week we're going to have a Jack Monroe issue going into the past and kind of, you know, getting mm-hmm. out of this super game changery moment. Um, and one, for one, I think it builds out the world nicely. Um, and for another, I think it gives us a moment to breathe and be like, holy shit, Bucky's back. You know, I think it gives you a moment to process because you need a moment to emotionally process a big thing like that. That's why Game Changers work so well at like the end of a TV season or at the end of a book in the middle of a series, because there's time to breathe in between and then you can adjust to the Game Changer and then you go forward. Um, So I, I, you know, I don't hate it. It's an act. It's Mm -hmm. act one of Mm -hmm. this story. Yeah, I don't hate that at all. I don't think it necessarily takes away from any of what this accomplishes as this arc. Um, I think it, what it does is it sets up a story that I want to come back for. And I'm not going to lie to you, Joshua. I've already read ahead. I was like, oh, my Fantastic. God, I have to see this. Um, I could not stop. I was so excited about it. So I, I read through um, and I'm going to finish this whole book and we'll see. Maybe we'll come back for a little bit more of it in future uh, seasons of In the Gutter as we get them planned out. But but uh, we do have a lot of comics to cover. Um, so, yeah. So uh, what did you think about about like the, the way this story kind of fell out here? 
No, I, I mean, I'm I'm with you. Mm-hmm. I, I really appreciate uh, cliffhangers, mm-hmm. honestly, like in television when mm-hmm. you're working with a commercial break. Like, I, I, I honestly appreciate that. Like, yeah. we, you're already committed. You're not going to bail in the middle. You know, that's not true. I actually did bail on Smallville during a <laughs> commercial break. So I shouldn't it say. It does happen. But a cliffhanger it over does a happen, commercial break. Rare. Like a, a cliffhanger also like over a commercial break, like a moment of <gasps> what's going to happen. You know, that I think is forgivable. Um, not that anybody has commercial breaks anymore because nobody watches, you know, regular broadcast television. But um, but like the the cliffhanger over a significant period of time, over something as long as a few months between one television season and the next, mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. a few years between one movie and the next, or one book and the next. I think that's where it becomes a little more egregious. I don't mind it from no, I, commercial. I, I don't mind it even. I don't even mind. Like, I don't love them, but I don't mind a cliffhanger from episode to episode when we're going like week to week or even month to month right. in, in the circumstance of a, of a comic book. I think that they get creaky the longer somebody has to wait for that yes. story to resolve. So I think that that's OK. Yeah, I want to speak to that in yeah. in serialized comics, mm-hmm. actually. Um, a month seems like a long time mm-hmm. to let a cliffhanger sit, but also that's the time that it takes for the next comic book to come out. But that's so, the established time frame of the next right, it's the possible smallest, moment. The yes. smallest increment of time, right? Exactly. And so one, one thing, especially with genre comics, like mm-hmm. superhero comics, uh, a piece of advice that I've read a lot is that like every page should make you turn to the next page. There yes. should be sort of a minor cliffhanger of some sort in the lower right hand corner of every page mm-hmm. if you can manage it. Yeah. Um, and what do you what does that look like at the end of the issue? Well, mm-hmm. that that looks like an actual cliffhanger, you know, yeah. that's just gonna last that one increment of time before the next issue. Mm-hmm. And I love all that. That's great stuff. That makes me happy as a genre guy, right? Yes. At the same time, yeah, the minute you start stretching it out very far, it's like it's too much. Yeah. Um, and and game changers really do feel like um legitimately sort of more mature or more yes. robust storytelling. And again, we're talking about Ed Brubaker, who <laughs> I've read a lot of his stuff. Uh, this is his, your first brush with him. Yeah. But right away, you were like, that man knows what he's doing. Exactly. And, and you're you're seeing that here. I felt Up to yeah, and including mm-hmm. the Jack Monroe issue. Yeah. Which which is a little awkward. Yeah. Right. We'll we'll talk about it when we when we actually read it. But it's a little awkward mm-hmm. um, in that we're we're you know, several issues after you felt the need to ask me a lot of Jack Monroe questions, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And I said, no, 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 it'll be better because it's from his perspective. And I stand by all that. Mm-hmm. But it's also, you're 100% right. For all of us, it made us sit in yes. that game changer for two increments of comic book publishing comic time. Comic book time, exactly. It didn't yeah. immediately resolve. Mm-hmm. We had to wait. Right. And that was hard. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't really reading this month to month, but it was yeah. still like, damn, you yeah. just made these people wait. Because you bastards. understood the experience. It's like when you're binging a TV show, but you understand the experience of watching week to week back when yes. that was a thing. Thank God we've passed through that hellscape, right? Um, and now we can binge everything. Um, but yeah, and the thing is, is that like, I think that uh, comic books and soap operas, and soap operas, I understand a little bit more because I watched them a lot when I was in high school. Sure. Um, and so I understand them a little bit more and they are kind of an entry into comic books for me because I think that they do share some storytelling DNA. And part of that DNA 100%. is cliffhanger, 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 you know, and constant escalations. Like, you know, uh, soap operas, at least when I watched them in the 80s, were just exhausting because it was constant escalation. <laughs> constant. And every yeah. now and again, you'd get a resolution and you'd be like, Luke and Laura got married. And then the next week, there was just more bullshit piling on. But that was what you went to them for. That was why you went right. to these, because you were invested in these characters. You were invested in these stories. And you wanted to go, you know, into that world and have that moment of like, oh, I don't know what's going to happen, you know. Um, so it's it's very exciting. Um, that's kind of the nature of the beast. So to see, especially to be in a form that really works with the cliffhanger as, as a deep seated part of its aesthetic, to see a game changer come in and just knock it out of the park um, is just incredibly powerful. All right, so here we are in this story. Um, We've got Cap and Bucky, and I honestly, at this point, have no idea which memories are real and which are not, because Cap Mm -hmm. has been saying all along that's not how it happened. But here, it seems like 
he is saying, you know how people get in a car accident can't remember anything after getting in the car. Like, right. maybe I just don't remember it. Maybe this is just memories that I didn't have right. So his memory was just wiped by trauma. So these memories of his are real. And then we have like these Nazi ghosts, you know, shooting real <laughs> bullets, which I think is really interesting. But we also have, you know, Bucky's death being that he jumped on this Nazi missile and got stuck yes, to it. Yes, that's blew accurate. Up. That's accurate. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yes. All right. All right. All right. Because it is, it's not, yeah, it's not too terribly different from, but for some reason, I was under the impression that in the comics, Bucky went in the ice with Cap. But Cap also says that he died here but he wasn't on the missile so was it just him falling into the water yeah they were both on the missile and uh and this is this is another thing that's worth pointing out is that the captain america comics in the wartime just kind of stopped like they didn't have an ending now Mm -hmm. now, i mean there were some other stuff that we talked about have been retcon to be the patriot in the spirit of 76 so there were some 50s cap Mm -hmm. stories that were about steve at the time that they've changed to not be about steve and but okay that's mm-hmm. that's why. Um, but once they pulled him out of the ice, they needed to kind of do a little like uh, uh, j- just in how things ended with Cap retcon. Because oh, okay. if they're going to end at the end of the war instead of in the 50s. Right. And those were other guys. What happened? So what actually happened? the the how they ended had not been answered until the 60s. Okay. And this is largely accurate right like the parts of this that um i think are cosmic cube fuckery are the kind of brutality like the level of brutality that zemo evinced that um but but yeah this is where he died Mm -hmm. i think he's referencing that this is where he went on the the drone that he would fall off and in the north atlantic and be frozen Okay. And that Bucky died. In the, in the, I, I don't honestly recall how specific they were about how Bucky died. They okay. were both on the bomb. Cap falls off. He freezes. Bucky dies. Okay. And okay. we are going to, in the next set of comics, find out how he did not die, like okay. in detail. Mm-hmm. Uh, as you know, since you cheated and read ahead. But <laughs> but yeah, that uh-huh. that part of this memory is basically the memory that I guess we collectively have. Okay. That's an interesting thing I just thought of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that Cap's memories are technically being changed by the Cosmic Cube, but we are sitting here reading this who probably, even in my case, haven't read every Captain America comic. Yeah. And I'm going like, are they though? Like, I don't. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ooh, a little meta-ness that I hadn't thought about until we're being We're being messed with on a lot of different levels. And I have to say, I think it's kind of cool. It gives you that sort of um, unstable feeling that happens when you have an unreliable narrator, except that we have an unreliable narrator who himself is aware of being unreliable um, to himself as well as to us. And that's the thing. Like when your narrator legitimately does not know what's going on, and then says, I think this is it, you know, then we are mm-hmm. left being like, I don't know I, what's going on, what's real and what's not. And you sort of share that state of mind with that character. It's a really nice effect. I like it a lot. Yes. I like it a lot. Yeah. It's it's a level of like self-identification with a character that we don't always get because yeah. that's like real varsity level storytelling stuff, yeah. you know, to, to get to that place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so in answer to you, I think yeah. that the majority of this is the memory as it happened, but mm-hmm. obviously there's also some cosmic cube fuckery because Zemo is just right. uh, extra large mm-hmm. bastard with a side of fries, uh, <laughs> you know, higher and more than, than he was before. And it is, I mean, you're talking about Nazi ghosts shooting real bullets and I'm going, but are they real? Like the only person we have to trust is Cap, Mm -hmm. who is dodging them and saying, oh, they're ripping up the wall or whatever. But it's like, yeah, but dude, like you're, (laughs) (laughs) but they're also Nazi ghosts. So like, and they disappear. They disappear, right. right? So what is making them real? Is he time traveling or are the are they time traveling and they think they're in 1945, but they're actually not? Um, is this just a memory? Like, that's what I kind of love about all of this is that you don't know. And it's not that the writer is lying to you. You know, yes. it's the writer is playing straight. This is what Cap is experiencing. And we don't know, which I really love. Um, we also have absolutely no idea specifically what the hell Lucan's up to. Like at the end of this How arc, much do you love that? 
Yeah. How much do you love that? You I mean, love him? I don't know. Yeah. Like, I mean, he's I really, clearly up to shenanigans, but clearly, you're like, but what is it? <laughs> well, but the thing that I love, though, is that he is using his enemy against itself. He understands capitalist yes. America's worship of large corporation and is going to hide behind that like every other evil bastard yep. in America does. I absolutely love that. Um, but he's OK. The other question I have for you is like, OK, he's holding up this cosmic cube, which is clearly charging and getting stronger. And earlier in the issue, and maybe I misunderstood this, but Cap says that death charges the cube. Right. And it was weak when Red Skull had it. So I'm guessing his death and all the other killing is charging the cube. Or did I misunderstand that? No, that's right. Okay. Um, the the receptor mm -hmm. that they talk about finding in the Red Skull's apartment, like yeah. it was hooked to receive. It was a receiver for broadcasters from all three of the cities mm -hmm. that were going to get firebombed. Okay. Right. That's they were. That's how they. You might recall. Right, right, that's right. how they figured out where they were because mm -hmm. they could kind of follow that that thing. Mm -hmm. And Lucan is just doing that now. Now here's the thing where I'll be honest. And any hardcore Marvel listeners, mm -hmm. please. Shout out to me because I'm not sure. Uh -huh. But I don't know if that's always been the case with the Cosmic Cube. Mm -hmm. um, or if that was just or if it's just we need a lot of uh, some kind of energy to boost it. And that emotional right. energy counts like death, destruction mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Because if Red Skull, let's just say Red Skull's like, well... I can make it solar powered. Mm -hmm. um, I can plug it into the wall. Mm -hmm. You know, I can make it motion like those watches that stay wound up mm -hmm. or mass murder. <laughs> Gang, I'm the Red Skull. I choose mass murder. You got to stay on brand. That's the thing. Yeah. You know, when you're a right. big time villain, if you if you go off brand at all, you completely lose all of your mojo. Yeah, it's, it's really one of the big things that separates <laughs> <laughs> costume criminal from criminals, the fucking costume. It's the bit. That's all you got. Super villain from yeah. villain is the mm -hmm. bit. It's what you got. You got to hang in there. <laughs> hey, Red Skull, I was just wondering, is there any way we could charge up the Cosmic Cube that isn't mass murder? You're fucking fired. You're not even asking the right questions for this organization, No, sir. and I will kill you and feed your death to the cube. That's how this is going <laughs> to go. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and now, Lucan, here's the thing. You have loved Lucan. Yes. As a somewhat more principled villain. Kind of, right? yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's part of the deal. Yeah. He, he murders the Red Guardian, but he he's, buries him with. He's, at least he's conflicted he, about it. He's still, you know, he'll yeah. still murder, but at least he's a little conflicted about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. he does not take joy mm -hmm. in the murder in the way that the Red Skull would, right? Um, it, like, and points this out, mm -hmm. you know, uh, repeatedly. Um, and yet here we are. With him on a smaller scale, mm -hmm. it's only one part of one city instead of the entirety of three cities. Right. But still, here we are with him willing to do the same thing, or at least one third of the same thing, mm -hmm. as the Red Skull to get what he wants. Yeah. And I was curious how that affected your admittedly nebulous views of Lucan, since we're still not sure what he's up to. Um, I enjoy Lucan... I, I, I think what it is about Lucan that I enjoy is the way that he is written. Like, I like the writing. Lucan as, like, a human is clearly, you know, like, garbage. Oh, like, he's bad know, news. I mean, he's yeah, totally, yeah. He's, he's a bad guy. Um, and he's, it's not the kind of bad guy that I love anyway, like a Spike, you know, from Buffy or something like that. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But I, I think there is, it's, I think it's really Brubaker's writing that I'm in love with yeah. here. I'm in love yeah. with the skill with which this character is drawn. Um, the shades of gray that are mixed in with the dark, dark black, you know? Um, so I really, really like um, the, the way this story is being told and the way that these characters are being written. Um, so I love Luke in sort of from that meta space um, as opposed yes, to yeah. as like the character. The character himself, I do find really interesting, but it's because of the way that he's written. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, that's, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Like he's... um. You start at the beginning and you're like, oh, perhaps he is a principled bad man. Right. And the longer you go, you're like, no, nope. no. I mean, technically, like he has a couple principles, but you also start to see that he's willing to sacrifice them, honestly, in the name of his revenge, which yeah. we're still getting the shape of. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And and again, this is just Brubaker being so good at his job. Right. You kind of have that telegraphed mm -hmm. with his mentor. Yeah. Right? Well, when yeah. When we met his mentor, who mm -hmm. was willing to sacrifice his men and this village mm -hmm. to get that Hydra weapon. Yeah. Uh, because because you have your super soldiers and, and we only we have, have our, our winter. winter. And the thing is, is that I felt that deeply. Like, I felt Karpov mm -hmm. deeply, you know, as as a bad guy. Um, But, yeah, but also a bad guy who was fighting with Cap. Like, you know, he yeah. was like, it was like the evolution, like, what is it that makes bad people bad? You know, that like something bad has happened. Like, you know, I mean, not to quote my therapist, but hurt people hurt people. Like, that's, yeah. you know, that's how it works. Yeah. Um. So speaking of hurt people, um, what's up with Zemo and his super weird hat? Why does he look like Cousin It? <laughs> oh, gosh. I don't know how you're going to feel about this explanation. So, yeah. So, um, as mentioned mm -hmm. previously, uh, Baron Zemo was originally the progenitor and boss of Hydra, the oh. super science wing of Nazi Germany. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not the Red Skull. The Red Skull would use Hydra mm -hmm. weapons, but he was not technically Hydra. He was leading armies and running around with Master Man and yes. mm -hmm. Arnim Zola and doing that shit. Okay. Hydra's doing super weapons and all that stuff. One of their super weapons created by Zemo himself was an indestructible glue, essentially mm -hmm. an adhesive that he called Adhesive X. And he had a nefarious, listen, it was <laughs> the 40s. No, it's okay. Just every now and again, you say the name no. of something and I find it in here, like, just amusing. Oh, no, it's it's ridiculous. <laughs> I Listen, this is why I don't like superhero comics treated like they're for grownups. Mm -hmm. the, one of the main pieces of joy is that people in them just say completely ridiculous shit. And everybody else in the room is like, yes, and this is how we die. <laughs> like, they're just... It's, I love it. I love yeah. it. And so when Zemo is like, ah, I can't do a bad German accent. Behold, Capitan, this is Adhesive X. With this, I will end the ally threat. And Cap's like, oh, yeah, and throws the shield and it breaks the thing and it gets on oh. Zemo. And there is no, and so Zemo had been wearing a mask, mm -hmm. like to to hide, like he was calling himself Baron Zemo, yeah. but he didn't want to be caught on film doing awful Nazi shit. Right. So he had a mask, mm -hmm. right? And the Adhesive X in an accident, gets on the mask, and it's stuck to his face forever. There is no solvent. That was literally the point of it, is that there's no solvent for adhesive X. Okay. Uh -huh. So he gets the mask stuck on him by Captain America, and that's, again, I realize it's fucking ridiculous, but that's how it became personal between the two of them. I love it. Yeah. All it's, right. <laughs> But that's why that so so mm -hmm. that was like his sort of knitted cap sort of uh yeah like but also but I really I actually really like the uh uh what, what should I say the draped mm -hmm. like the draped mask yeah. it's really not practical for your action heroes mm -hmm. obviously like it's just gonna come off but um and, and shout out to everybody every boy my age now a man when I say Cobra Commander uh -huh. was like even more threatening. When he was out of his like battle helmet and just had the the blue mask, like the cloth mask just draped over him. Like I think it's a really like kind of creepy look. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Zemo can't take it off is sort of like like you got your hoisted on your own petard villain <laughs> stuff. Even if Adhesive X is kind of, you know, like kind of ridiculous. 40s nonsense. Ah, whatever. <laughs> All right, Josh, so tell me, um, in this issue, what is your favorite page, your favorite piece of art? Uh, so my favorite piece of art is actually one panel, but it, it really works within the page. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the one panel, I guess it's two, because we need to establish that it is actually Bucky mm -hmm. with the sniper rifle mm -hmm. looking through the thing. But the panel that just kills me is the picture of an absolutely shocked Captain America, because mm -hmm. Sharon has just said, I think it's Bucky. And he could not be more floored. Yeah. And the way that we view this is through Bucky's lens, which is literally a thing that could take Cap's head off right there. Yeah. Which, mm -hmm. kind of a callback 
to issue one Mm -hmm. where Red Skull says, I could put a bullet through his eyes anytime, but that's not good enough for Steve Rogers, (laughs) right? (laughs) And then what's Lucan do? He puts a bullet right through Red Skull Mm -hmm. because that is good enough for noted Nazi fuckhead, the Red Skull. (laughs) And then here we have this moment where, again, I want to point out, Lucan is actually mirroring the Red Skull here, Mm -hmm. right? Because Bucky's like, I got him. I could just take him out right now. And Lucan's like, not yet. He's got to suffer more first. Well, yeah, and he also says, um, uh, you know, despite your feelings about him, and the Bucky's like, I don't have feelings. Yeah. He's just really good. So I find that an interesting kind of hint that Bucky has got some resentment against Cap, and I presume that'll be coming back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's gonna come up yeah. a little bit. But I just I just really, I, I like, I love that it's the real, okay, there's just like a layer, Mm -hmm. like multi-layers going on here, where it's the realization that Bucky might be alive that shocks Cap, and the reaction shot we get of that is Bucky going, I could just end this now if you like, boss. Yeah. And our our up till now principled bad guy Mm -hmm. sounds like our unprincipled bad guy in that moment. Mm -hmm. And there's just like, just like, there's just a lot going on. There's so much. In in these two panels. That, no, it's not. Yeah, so so good. It's not so Okay, I've gushed. What is your favorite piece of art? What I find hilarious about what have been my favorite moments throughout is that, again, as I have stated a thousand times, I'm not a fan of action scenes. Do not care for them. They tend to bore me, right? Um, but the way Epstein does action, I think, is so fascinating and so powerful and so efficient. The page where Bucky jumps on the missile and then we see Cap's POV as he falls away and cannot do anything yeah. with the yes. inset panels getting smaller and thinner as hope fades i'm all in i think it's so great okay you you are dialing in on some of the stuff that comics can do Mm -hmm. that no one else can do like no other format can do this Mm -hmm. and what what i think is really fascinating considering the name of this podcast is when you have ever vanishing Mm -hmm. panels you have a lot of gutter yeah Mm -hmm. But you don't actually have a lot that you need to fill in. What they want you to fill in in that gutter is the emotion Mm -hmm. of watching it get further away, right? Like normally you're kind of filling in the action. Yeah. You know, what happened? Mm -hmm. But in that one, you're like, oh, you're filling in the feeling. Oh, my God. And I mean, I just defy you to find another piece of art, a storytelling art that can do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. The ver- I, I, I've said it before in other episodes, the versatility of the gutter itself yes. is is just a tool that comics have that nobody else has. Yeah. It's amazing. And what they do with it is absolute genius. I mean, I, I the more comics I read, the more deeply, deeply impressed I am with how all of this works. Um, all right. So let's go to favorite part of the story. Uh, what's that for you, Josh? Double page spread. Where Cap is like working to save Sharon, and then he mm-hmm. gets there and takes the the uh, uh, the gag off of her mouth, yeah. and she says, "I saw his face. I think it's Bucky." Mm-hmm. And the reason, and and I know these are kind of related, right? But I separated out my art from this because yeah. the the art is about that multi layered exactly. story stuff. Mm-hmm. In this one, th- this just hits because Sharon knows what she's saying yeah. and how it's going to affect this man mm-hmm. she knows so well. Yeah. Um. And and. So I guess this is kind of art, too, because Epting really does that face acting with her. Mm-hmm. She is. She will not make eye contact with Steve when yeah. she says that. Mm-hmm. And there's that one tear. I mean, it's just that's just a really. What, what, I mean, we've been building to it for mm-hmm. all these issues yeah. in a real way. Mm-hmm. Like Fury kind of knows or Fury, Fury kind of suspects Lucan's got a thing and it's clues here and there for mm-hmm. you and I, the reader. And then it just comes together in this moment and instead of it being bombast. Yeah. That realization is not the bombast. It's this quiet moment of, I'm about to break this man's heart. Yeah. You know, anyway, mm-hmm. I, again, I'm I'm very invested in the, my best <laughs> moments this episode. Yeah. Uh, Lonnie, what is your favorite story moment? Well, yeah, the Bucky reveal, right? I mean, what hits right. you in the face more than that Bucky reveal? And not just the reveal that he is, you know, he's the guy who killed Red Skull and that he's the one who's out there, you know, as part of this, you know, team just murdering the shit out of these cities, but also that he hates Cab. 
Like, honestly, yeah. like that moment where he, whatever his feelings are about Cap, you know, that he wants to kill him now, you know, um, I find that's heartbreaking too. Like, you know, yeah. what happened to Bucky? Now, I know a little more. Mm-hmm. Well, you've read ahead, so you know. I've read too. a little bit ahead. But, I haven't read all of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But one thing that I, that I think. Mm hmm. And, and I want to say I think they're doing this because it's a real contrast with the MCU. And we'll talk more about that as yeah. we get more into mm-hmm. the Bucky stuff. Mm-hmm. But is that Lucan is assuming mm-hmm. that Bucky has feelings about Captain America. And and I should say the Winter Soldier. We're yes. not dealing with Bucky, right? right. So mm-hmm. Lucan assumes that the Winter Soldier has feelings about Captain America. And he says, I don't have any feelings. And I don't yeah. think that's a lie. Right. At this point in the story, I think mm-hmm. Lucan assumes things because he knows things that the Winter Soldier does not know. Mm-hmm. And so at a certain point, it's like the indifference yeah. is almost a bigger punch in the gut to me than hatred would be. You know, it really is. But the thing is, like, Lucan's presumption is not that Bucky would be conflicted about killing Cap, but that Bucky would want to kill cap and right. that i find so interesting too because like what it, is that you know so there's the, a lot going on yeah, so the idea that there's the expectation that bucky hates cap and then yes that cold slap of total indifference um i mean that is uh, the stuff that happens in this moment it really is just so incredibly powerful and then you're just sitting there like i don't even know what just happened i'm gonna have to read this page a few more times and try to understand exactly what's going on here um it is you know and and this is without having the context and the extra textual metatextual stuff that was going on as far Mm -hmm. as comic book readers Mm -hmm. at the time um for me even coming into this cold it's still really really powerful i think so all right we'll be back next week with captain america winter soldier number seven in which we learn about the tragic life and death of jack monroe Thanks for listening to In the Gutter with Joshua Anru and Lonnie Diane Rich. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider talking about it with your friends, leaving a review somewhere, or supporting Chipperish Media, patreon.com slash chipperish.